Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. Having turned onto the Moselle River, we headed down to Kochum. Kochum started out as a Celtic settlement, then the Romans came along, and finally the local German dynasties. In the 11th century, construction began on the city's Reichsburg Castle. It was built at a key point on the river, at a point where the owner of the castle could block the traffic on the Moselle by hanging a chain across the river from one side to the other. They also had a few nice cannons so they could blast you into pieces. If you wanted to continue your trip, you paid a toll. If you didn't pay the toll, the soldiers would throw you in the river and take your ship. Hmm, seems like a pretty straightforward offer. The rulers got rich and the castle got better furnishings. Our castle was built the first time around the year 1000. And the builder of this castle were Franconian Palatine Counts. They were from Aachen and they were the owners here until 1151. But in 1689, the castle was destroyed. It was blown up, burned down. Destroyers were French troops. It was Sun King Louis XIV. And he destroyed all the castles between Heidelberg and Kochum to make inheritance claims. All the walls are painted. These are not wallpapers. And you have to imagine that here in the past all the walls were colored with gold leaf. The style of the furniture we call Renaissance. A basic part of Renaissance design is balance. So if there's a door on one side of a room, there has to be a door on the other. But this door leads to a rather interesting room. Nothing. On the ceiling, can you see the four symbols? These are the cardinal virtues. There you see wisdom, bravery, prudence and justice. But for the fifth one, the chastity, we had no space in the room. <laughs> but these are lions. The lions, they have a knight's helmet on the head. The wiser is pulled down and therefore it looks like a frog. Maybe you've seen the same figure outside, a bigger one by the cannon. It's not a frog, a lion. Well, the Moselle is my favorite river valley in the world. I think it's about the most beautiful uh, part of Germany. It has the most beautiful, most charming towns. For thousands of years, people have been using rivers as a primary means of transportation. It was usually easier and safer to move things on a river than on a road. But many rivers were too shallow or too narrow for anything but a small boat. One way of solving that problem was to build a series of dams. The rivers got deeper and wider, but then you had the problem of a river with different levels, similar to a set of steps. The invention that dealt with the steps is called a lock. 
A lock is a mechanical system for raising or lowering a boat as it passes from one level of a river to another. Like an elevator, it can take you up or down. It has a chamber with gates at both ends. A boat or boats go in. The gates are closed and water is either pumped into the chamber to raise the boat or pumped out to lower the boat. When the water has reached the proper level, one of the gates is opened and the boat sails on. The first gates used in Europe worked like a guillotine. The gate was held in a frame and raised and lowered like a guillotine. One day, Leonardo da Vinci took a break from painting the Mona Lisa and invented a new and improved form of lock. The doors were in a V shape, so the downstream pressure actually kept them closed. In 1478, he oversaw the construction of six of these new locks, and they were fabulously successful. Our next stop was the town of Burncastle. And we were able to dock at the edge of the old town and just walk in. The entry point to Burncastle is the road that passes alongside the Tower of St. Michael's Church. The tower was built in the 1300s and was originally part of the town's defenses. It's a nice touch. There you were in the church tower praying for victory while you were throwing hot stones on your enemy. Convenient. And I think Burncastle is my favorite from the architecture, from the structure, from the way the town is set up. It is absolutely gorgeous. The town is most famous for its half-timbered houses. Half-timbered houses are made by building a frame of wood and then filling in the open space between the wood beams with clay, or brickwork, or just plain rubble. The exterior and interior surfaces were often covered with plaster. It's one of the most environmentally responsible, ecologically friendly, and aesthetically pleasing architectural styles, and it was developed about a thousand years ago in Northern Europe. England, Denmark, Germany, and parts of France and Switzerland had lots of forests. Timber was in good supply, but there was a shortage of stone and the skilled workmen needed to cut that stone. If you were a skilled stone cutter, you had all the work you needed building a cathedral. A farmer's house was not something you wanted to work on unless it belonged to the king or your father-in-law. The half-timbered houses had many advantages. At the time, the basic building material was a tree or a tree stump. All the work was done by hand. The tools were axes and knives and hand-powered drills. A farmer could gradually put the frame together, fill in the walls, and end up with a structure capable of handling a great deal of weight with very little of the internal space squandered on supports. And if he wanted to move the house, he could knock out the filling between the wood frame, move the beams to a new location, and fill in the space with new clay, a relatively easy process. Burn Castle is also well known for its wine. Accordingly, Amma took us to a private wine tasting. Above the town is a hill that has a famous story. During the 1300s, the bishop was quite ill and about to die. He said that anybody who could save him would get a great reward. Kid shows up with a big barrel of wine, starts giving it to the bishop a little more every day. The bishop recovers. The reward, all the wine from that hill will be labeled doctor. Today there are four families who share that hill and all of their wines are marked doctor. Unfortunately, most of our medical insurance policies do not cover the good doctor's wine. However, it's probably worth the investment. When 
we returned to the ship, the captain was having a final night party. Quite frankly, it looked like the party we were having every night. Except on this night, we were formally introduced to the members of the staff. Chef de party. Each of them appeared to have their individual fans. Next day, we headed to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, one of the smallest countries in the world. It's wedged in between Belgium, France, and Germany, and has been a heavily fortified military site for thousands of years. It was often referred to as the Gibraltar of the North. This is the very place where we come from. In fact, uh, right behind me you have this uh, promontory, the Bock Promontory, where the first castle of Luxembourg was built in the 10th century. We were a county, then we became a duchy in the 14th century, and then the Burgundians started a period of 400 years of foreign domination. After <coughs> Burgundy, it was Spain, uh, France, Austria, um, Prussia, and uh, Holland, who decided what happened with Luxembourg. They all left traces behind. Luxembourg always has been a very interesting uh, place uh, of strategic importance in the middle of Europe, and you were always very close to your next friend or to your worst enemy, right in the middle of Europe. Right now we are standing on the ramparts of our fortress walls. It was the perfect place to build a fortress. All you had to do was build ramparts, walls on the existing rocks that you see in front of, of you. These are the rocks and the typical sandstone that you will find everywhere in Luxembourg. And it, since it's a very soft stone, it was very easy to build ramparts and to dig what we call today the famous labyrinth of the casemates. Um, the casemate is actually a labyrinth of underground tunnels. So you have to imagine Luxembourg like a Swiss cheese. It's uh, <laughs> under our feet. You have um, 17 kilometers of tunnels and galleries carved into the rock. This city has been built on two levels. Uh, we're standing on the upper level of the city, but then you have the lower part of the city and it goes down 50 meters. It was the perfect the perfect setting for a fortress city. This was for centuries a battlefield of the Europeans and it has become a working place of the European Union, so symbolic. Luxembourg is a linguistic meeting point where the Germanic languages of Northern Europe encounter the Romantic languages of the South. monarchy with hereditary succession. The executive power rests with the Grand Duke, who appoints the Prime Minister. The Duke does all the meet him and greet him stuff, and the Prime Minister and his cabinet run the place. We are right in front of the most prestigious building in town. It is the Grand Ducal Palace, in other words, the residence in town of His Royal Highness Grand Duke Henry, the head of state of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. The architecture is quite extraordinary for a northern country uh, because it shows us um, Spanish Renaissance. It is the palace in town of the monarch where he receives the official state's guests. 
the balcony has uh, also quite a symbolic meaning to the Luxembourgers because if there is a royal wedding um, or a special event, then the royal family shows up on the balcony and the crowd of people uh, greet them in the streets. On this balcony, for instance, the generation of my grandparents saw Grand Duchess Charlotte come back from her exile in America in April 1945. Napoleon was also received in this building uh, as Luxembourg was French under Napoleon. It is a relatively small but a very elegant palace which was restored in 1995. Since 1919, voting by adult citizens has been compulsory. Vote or else. So here we have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Commerce, of Finances, of Agriculture, and at the end, a Michelin-starred restaurant. One out of 13 in the country, we have the highest concentration of starred restaurants in uh, the world. And in the center of the square, we have uh, the monument of Her Royal Highness Grand Duchess Charlotte, who was on the throne from 1919 to 1964, a long period of 45 years, cut by the Second World War when she was in exile in the United States. She became close to President Roosevelt who promised her, my child, I'll bring you back home. And that happened in April 1945. There's a considerable amount of cultural activity in Luxembourg. Of particular interest is the Mudam Museum. The architect was I.M. Pei, and the building reflects his modern approach to architecture, which is in keeping with the museum's objectives. He chose this particular place in Luxembourg City, and he chose it because um, on this spot here we have remains of the fortress of uh, the city of Luxembourg. And he built um, onto the fortress, but with much respect to the fortress. So he kind of echoes the original design of the fortress walls that are by Vauban, who built many uh, forts in uh, Europe. So it is a kind of a beautiful marriage of old and new, what's happened here. The exhibitions are designed to introduce visitors to contemporary art. Artists are given a specific space in the museum and invited to do whatever they want within that space. One, two, three, four. More this is a piece by um, Luxembourg's most famous artist. She is, uh, her name is Sume Tse. That doesn't sound very Luxembourgish, and this is so because she is, uh, her father is Chinese. And what is quite interesting too is that she trained as a cellist. So every one of her pieces involves sound. Marie Lund, the artist, she took a piece of stone, in this case it was um, marble, and knocked on it in one strong gesture. And that's how it broke. And the break kind of creates a horizon if you want to look at the marble like a landscape. Now, how would I know this wonderful story if you weren't here to tell me? Well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's what I do in the museum. I am the mediator. So basically, I, am, I replace all the text on the walls and all the reading people have to do and the audio guide and whatever. We try to have real people to talk to the visitors about the art. I tell them that in case of doubt, it is always art. Because you are inside a museum and a, a piece of stone dropped somewhere uh, next to a wall is probably art because you are in the museum. Outside the museum you can't be certain. Uh, and then I can start to explain how it got there and, and what it's doing. The town also has an excellent open market. I went shopping with Kathy Giorgetti, who was with the Luxembourg Tourist Association. This is William Second Square, and uh, it's market day. So uh, Saturday and Wednesday, twice a week, uh, you see plenty of people coming 
to town for shopping and um, most of people are looking for fresh, organic food. So you have all these little stalls with uh, vegetables, flowers, fruits and homemade products that they sell. And oh, look at these Savoy cabbages. Ooh. Makes me want to make soup. Yeah. Actually, everything I want for soup yes. is right on these tables. Whenever I come to this market, I really feel like cooking or, you know. Yeah. On your left side, you have Luxembourgish homemade products. These are bio products. It's uh, apples. They are organic. They are not. Uh, no chemi chemistry. And William II statue, actually. It's just in front of us. What's he got in his hand? Oh, cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a cabbage. <laughs> he came here to shop. Ah, I like a king who does his own shopping. <laughs> But you have to taste this because this is typical Luxembourgish food. It's pastry with meat and inside it has some white wine, Riesling, and we call it Riesling's Pastet. <laughs> okay. What do you think? It's pâté en croûte with jelly. Yes? I got it. I got it. The nice thing is that you always see people that you know. Luxembourg is small, everyone knows everyone. It's more fun because you will meet your neighbors or some people you haven't seen and then you go for coffee and uh, it's also about socializing. Yeah. That's what markets were meant yeah. to be. And around the market are some outstanding shops. Right at the edge of the market is a little shop where they have all of the great wines made by the Luxembourg vintners, and you can come in and get a free sample of each. So uh, I'm gonna be here for quite a while. I offer you a brief musical interlude. was interesting. Luxembourg also has some of the best restaurants in Europe. My favorite is the one owned and run by Leah Linster. She was the first female chef to win the Bocuse d'Or award and in 1987 the Michelin Guide awarded her restaurant its first star. Leah was busy studying law at the university when her father's sudden passing required her to return home and take over the family business which consisted of a combination cafe, restaurant, and gas station. I always cooked. I loved to see all these tourists and to see everybody, and then I cooked for them. And I remember at, uh, when I was around 10 years old, I loved to cook soups for the Dutch guests because they were not so spoiled at that time. <laughs> she makes the best Madelines I have ever tasted. And the recipe is quite simple. The batter is made from butter, sugar, egg whites, ground almonds, and flour. It rests in the refrigerator overnight, and it's piped into a madeleine form and into the oven for five minutes. Because she feels they are at their best the day they are baked. So I ate 15, just to help her out. It's important to be there for your friends. My food is, uh, has, uh, of course, it's classical French food from the real fine French cuisine, but I always put my, it my way because I, I'm, like you say, you would say a very foody person and, uh, well, things have to have the right taste. That's very important for me, so I care a lot for the taste. She also prepared a saddle of lamb wrapped in potato crust. This was the recipe that won her the Bocuse d'Or. I put the full recipes for the Madelands and the Saddle of Lamb on our website, bertwolf.com. Well, that's sailing from Cochem to Luxembourg. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. For a printed copy of this show, send a stamped envelope and $3 to this address. Please mark envelope with show number. The same information is available free on BertWolf.com. 
Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines and by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation.